Good day, I'm Martin Gago with Market Radius Research. It's Wednesday, December the 15th, and we're getting a quick news update from CEO Michael McFadden of Alpha Cognition. Alpha Cognition is a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company developing treatments for re neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, dementia, and ALS. Remember, this is neither a recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company and its industry. Do your own due diligence and come to your own investment conclusions. We first met with Michael three months ago back in September. Please check that video out on this channel if you want to get a deep dive into the company. And please subscribe to Radius Research to get updated with the latest CEO interviews. Michael, as I was telling you earlier, I was very confused when I read the news release as the stock, stock actually dropped on the news. I assumed the news was negative data from your preclinical study, but actually the data seemed very positive. I'd like you to walk us through the data readout from the Alpha 1062 study, explain its implications, and then maybe refresh us on what investors should be looking for from Alpha Cognition in the coming year. Thanks for joining us. But before we get on to the recent news, can you give us a refresher on the company? Just a quick one minute overview. Sure. And Martin, thanks for having me back. It's always a pleasure to talk about our company. So, for those who don't know Alpha Cognition, we're a company focused on neurodegenerative diseases. We have three pipeline products, uh, actually, four now pipeline products in our portfolio focused on ALS on mild traumatic brain injury and on Alzheimer's disease. So we're tackling big stuff at, at the company with what we believe are very innovative compounds. All right. So um, a couple of, or actually last week, I guess it was, you, you had a, a preclinical, um, uh, is that the right term? Preclinical? Pre preclinical um, mm -hmm. pre study on Alpha 1062. That was on a, a rodent study, correct? You're correct. Yes. Yeah. So uh, explain what what did you do and what were the, was the outcome? Yeah. So this was a study looking at a mo moderate traumatic brain injury. The reason we looked at moderate versus we're seeking indication for mild is a white matter difference in rodents versus humans. So you go a little bit more aggressive in the testing. The study was designed to look at uh, several things. One, how did our drug compare to uninjured animals, and how did our drug compare to injured but non-treated animals. And we looked at a variety of, diff of uh, neurobehavioral tests and neurocognition tests to understand was the drug performing or not. So we, we think the data could not be better. We were stat sig better than the injured but not treated group in every endpoint. So all behavioral, all cognitive, functional tests, our drug outperformed injured but not treated. Then the question Sorry. is, yeah. Sorry. And you said stat sig, statistically significant. Exactly, statistically significant. Sorry, I'm, I'm using a, <laughs> uh, our abbreviation language here. Um, and then we also looked at our drug versus uninjured. So these were animals that were not injured, uh, therefore not needing treatment. In four of five neurobehavioral or cognition tests, our drug was equal with uninjured animals. Uh, which is, it's a holy grail actually of these trials. Can you, can you equal an uninjured or a uh, not sick uh, participant in the trial? And so we were very pleased to say four out of five endpoints, we equaled uninjured animals. So, so we, we, we look at the data in context and say from a neurobehavioral and cognition standpoint, the drug's doing exactly what it should be doing. And uh, the, the data was the best that we could hope for. So on one side, you were statistically significantly improved over the injured animals. Yes. And in all five aspects. And in four of the five, it was from your behavioral uh, testing, you, you could see no difference between the injured and treated animals and the never injured animals. Yeah, indistinguishable. So yeah. both groups behaved exactly the same or performed yeah. at the same measure of the test, uh, which is it's very rare that you see these types of results in, a, in an early stage study like this. So it indicates sort of complete cure, so to speak. Of course, it's mice and you never know exactly what that all means and yeah. everything, it, how it, it translates to people. You can't interview them, but you look at their how fast they go through a maze or that kind of a thing? Uh, we look at how fast they go through a maze, their ability to process uh, and a, a series of cognitive tests. 
Um, we look, run them through a number of tests to say, can they, uh, do they have dexterity? Can they solve problems? Um, do they have reasoning? And you hope that the non-injured animal, the non-injured animal set the standard and you hope that your, your treated animals function the same as the non-injured. And these are routine uh, MTBI tests that have been run for probably two decades. Uh, by CROs who specialize in traumatic brain injury. Right. Okay, so now that you have this data, and I guess there's a, some additional data that still comes out of this. You did behavioral tests, and it sounds like you're doing an autopsy. I don't know if that's the right term, but you're checking out the brain to see how much, like what physical manifestations there are there. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a series of his, uh, histology tests to look at what is actually happening in the brain with drug, and yeah. is it affecting various proteins and uh, other aspects of brain physiology to understand exactly why the behavioral test resulted the way they did. And that right. is to come in uh, Q1 of 2022. Gotcha. Uh, let's assume that that data is consistent with uh, the, the behavioral study. What happens next then with uh, 1062? Yeah, so we'll have, the data was so strong, we'll have a meeting with the FDA to provide guidance, uh, show them the data, provide guidance or, or receive guidance from the FDA on what next steps will be. It'll be one of two things. It'll be second mammal, uh, or the FDA may say the data is strong enough that we can move into humans. The reason they might say that is we've already completed all of our toxicity pharmacology work for the product. So all of our phase one data is complete. So the drug is safe uh, and we've demonstrated that over a series of probably 20, 20 different uh, trials that we have run. So that leads us to, to, to think that if the data continues to be as strong as our first round of data, that the FDA could accelerate the program. Right. And the reason they might do that is there's no approved therapy for tra uh, traumatic brain injury, it affects about 3 million people a year. There's high need to attempt to treat patients who are suffering from concussion or other head injury. Um, but we'll have to see what the, the FDA uh, says to us once they look at our data. Okay, and then if you do other uh, mammal studies, do you go to bigger animals or just run yeah. additional tests or more complicated tests on mice? Or, uh, we go or to bigger animal, like? we, we're seeking to replicate what we, uh, what we showed in the first mammal. Gotcha. And roughly how long would that process take then to do that animal the second animal uh, study. Those, those studies typically take about three months to run. Yeah. And they take about two, two and a half months to analyze the data. So you're looking about half year. Gotcha. And then let's say it is fortunate enough to move into the human trials. That would then go to a phase two trial? It would either go to a phase two trial or a phase two slash three trial. Yeah. Um, again, depending on how strong our data is. Uh, often when there is no... Uh, current treatment on the market. Nothing has been approved and nothing works. Uh, so very low standard of care, but high need. The FDA sometimes will allow companies to accelerate their, their trial construct. But we'll, again, we'll have to take that lead from the agency. Gotcha. And just to clarify, 1062, that is the same drug for mild or moderate traumatic brain injury, as well as what you're looking at for Alzheimer's dementia, correct? It is, yes. And the, the, the thesis on why the drug may work for traumatic brain injury, there's two hallmark symptoms for traumatic brain injury. Number one is brain inflammation. Not surprising, you hit your head, you could have some inflammation. Number two is there's a cognitive cloudiness that patients describe. It's similar to a condition called chemo fog. People having chemotherapy, they come out and go, I can't think straight. It's, it's look like they're walking around in a fog. Those are two hallmark symptoms. Our drug actually has some effect on inflammation. And we know from our AD data that it improves cognition. So uh, the, the, there's some similarities, I think, in both diseases that gave us hope that the drug could work. And we're still very bullish on that program. And the, the trials that you're running uh, for Alzheimer's dementia, that is a separate set of trials and what you're doing for traumatic, uh, mild traumatic brain injury. And not only separate set of trials, but separate delivery system. So for traumatic brain injury, we have a drug device combination. It yeah. is an intranasal formulation. So you breathe it into your nostril, pushes drugs straight into the brain. Yeah. Um, 
For so it's like a nasal a, spray essentially or? Yeah, it's very similar to a nasal spray. Okay. And then for the uh, AD program, we have an oral, it's an oral or a tablet market. So we have a yep. tablet for that uh, indication. Gotcha. And so what, what does the uh, 2022 look like for the Alzheimer's dementia uh, program? It, it's probably the most exciting time in our company's history. We have top line results from our pivotal trial that will be released in Q2 of 2022. Yeah. Uh, we have a patient tolerability study that's starting in twenty uh, for second quarter of 2022. So we'll be announcing the start of that study and then enrolling that study uh, through the course of the year. We'll have NDA filing if our data is positive in Q3 of 2022. So tremendous amount going on with the AD program uh, to advance that program toward approval. And then we have top line results on our TBI program that'll be announced in Q1 of 2022. And then depending on the FDA results, we, should, we could have additional announcements on that program. Okay, well, with the AD program, you mentioned there's the tolerability as well as your pivotal study. Isn't that backwards? Don't you first do the tolerability and then go to the the uh, toler uh, the tolerability and then go to sort of the the pivotal study? Could you just sort of differentiate those two? Yes, that's a great great uh, question. We have tolerability is not to be confused with toxicity or safety. So the safety okay. toxicity of our drug already those studies have been completed. They were all positive, so we know our drug is safe and yeah. non-toxic. We are running a tolerability study primarily for commercialization purposes. So we need to demonstrate that our drug has placebo-like side effects, which we believe it does for, uh, from a GI perspective and also insomnia. Those are hallmark side effects that affect many patients who are treated with agents for Alzheimer's dementia. We wanna demonstrate our drug has very low side effect threshold and people can actually tolerate it, stay on the drug. Uh, right, we also are looking placebo at placebo uh, yeah. uh, like so it's not a real physiological like uh, let's say um lack like not being able to sleep that that it's not actually you don't see any physical manifestations of it but the people just say oh I can't sleep now or they do say that and you'll you'll see physical manifestations mostly on the GI side effects so okay. a fairly large number of patients will suffer from diarrhea from nausea yeah. from vomiting uh, when they take drugs like ours, this, they're called acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. They're drugs like with a name brands that you might know, like Aricept or Exalon. Those are commonly used agents. But what happens in the market is when patients take those drugs, about a third of patients have to stop taking them within four months, mainly due to those types of side effects. So imagine we had a, if our, if our mother had Alzheimer's, she took a therapy and she was throwing up every time she took it. We would, we would try to help her and clean up the, the, the mess that resulted from that several times. But if it continued over the course of a week, we're probably calling her doctor back and saying, doctor, it's, she's having side effects. We, I need to put her on something else. And we see that, ha that trend happening with the current therapy. So we believe if our drug can demonstrate what we've already demonstrated, by the way, in a small patient cohort in a larger patient study that that is highly differentiating in the market. And it's something that we would seek a label change for, for our product so that we could go to physicians and say, our drug has very low or no side effects. Uh, you can give this safely for your patients. Doctors tell us in market research that is highly needed and would be very differentiating for any new drug in the class. Because your 1062 for AD is sort of equivalent to an existing drug out there, but is lacking those negative side effects. And that's where sort of helps facilitate your, your trial program and, um, and, and getting uh, FDA approval, uh, hopefully. Yeah, it, it does. And what we have done as a reminder, we have taken a 505B2 pathway for our AD program. That means we have to show bioequivalence to an existing drug in the market. Our, that, that bioequivalence drug for us is Razadine or Galantamine. If we show bioequivalence with our pivotal trial, then we, we can have an approved drug. So we can file NDA, we'll obtain approval from the FDA and we can market the drug. What we think is important for the market and for physicians to make 
good therapeutic choices? What, what, how does our product differentiate itself from others on the market? And that will happen through either safety tolerability or increased efficacy. We are focused on safety tolerability and getting to a therapeutic dose faster through an a do, uh, accelerated dosing regimen. So we'll, we'll seek two of three uh, to demonstrate, and we think that's very meaningful in the Alzheimer's market. Okay. And so just a quick recap on the, the news flow. In uh, Q1, we're going to be getting uh, the, the traumatic brain injury uh, enhanced data coming out in, in Q1. And then on the AD side, is there any expected news on uh, that in Q1, or is that more of Q2 news flow? More of Q2. Okay. Yeah. And then you, I, I, I failed to mention one of the programs we're most excited about. We have a gene therapy program for ALS. This is progranulin, full-length progranulin gene therapy. Could be curative for a condition like ALS, which has 100% morbidity, usually within five years. So we have a preclinical study ongoing right now. Uh, it's a survivability study in an ALS mammal. So we're testing to see if our drug keeps those mammals alive, in which case, if it, you know, if it does, we'd be able to move that program forward as well. Uh, it's one of the hottest areas in neuroscience right now, progranulin research, and we, we believe we have amazing compound uh, that could be very, very helpful for a segment of patient population that has no hope right now. And what is the rough timing on that uh, initial mammal study? Uh, trials, trials ongoing now. It's it's coming to completion end of year. We'll yeah. uh, take some time to look at our data. Yeah. Uh, we'll also look at histology data with that program as well, and we'll release that data in uh, Q1 of 2022. Okay, so you got a busy uh, year ahead of you. Yeah, it's a, like I said, it's the most exciting year for our company. Now you see why we have uh, three three programs where we'll be releasing what we believe is really significant data. Uh, to move those programs forward and uh, provides a great inflection point for investors and uh, allows us to move our programs forward if, if the data is successful. All right, Michael, we should wrap it up. Any final comments? No, I, I, again, I, I think it's a great opportunity for investors when you're looking at a CNS uh, company with multiple shots on goal uh, that's taken a de-risk approach to the market where so many other companies have failed at alpha cognition uh, has taken a, a pr what we believe is a pr pretty smart approach to AD and a very exciting approach to uh, ALS with our programming concept. So it's, we, we believe the company is really worth looking at uh, if, as an investor. Right. Michael, thank you very much for joining us. That was a great update. Cheers.